So this is part two of the uh, video uh, for theories in career development week one. Uh, please ensure that you've watched part one before you continue on to uh, the second part of the PowerPoint slides. So just picking up where we left off in the previous video, here we uh, are looking at some important definitions that you need to just have in the back of your mind. We toss a lot of these words around uh, in the course and in the program and so it's important to have some sense about what each one of these means. So when we talk about a career that really is referring to uh, the entirety of roles that an individual plays over their lifespan. So that may include paid work, uh, unpaid work, so for example volunteer, uh, leisure or recreation activities, education and learning. We can use the acronym PULL to represent that paid, unpaid, leisure and learning. We will come back to that uh, acronym and that definition when we are in the course Career and Employment Resources in the second semester. But it's important for you to have this sense of, of encompassing all of the things that a client has done over their lifespan and to count all of that as experience and to look at the skills that they have learned and demonstrated in all of these things. So clients might you know, often discount work that they've done that was volunteer or unpaid uh, when in fact they may have demonstrated, learned and demonstrated some very important skills through that work. If someone as a volunteer has, has helped to coordinate events, um, they've demonstrated event planning and event coordinating skills. It doesn't really matter whether they were paid or unpaid for those uh, skills. So um, it's important for you to bring that view when you're working with clients and that also you help your clients understand, especially if you're helping them, you know, put together a resume or identify their skills and their experience uh, that might be of value in the labor market, that you have them look at all of what they have learned and all of the skills that they've demonstrated. The definition of career choice relates to decisions that have been made during one's life about work uh, or related activities. And um, it used to be many decades ago that when someone made a career choice or an occupational choice, maybe they went to school and got trained or they, they did an apprenticeship or they did something to get into a particular type of occupation and then they may have spent, had a good chance of spending their entire life doing that particular occupation, maybe moving up in the organization uh, and so on. But that's not the case anymore. So I uh, apologize for the sound of my phone in the background. <laughs> um, so career choice can be today uh, it can be something that people have to do multiple times uh, in the course of their career. And so, again, we want to empower and help our clients learn how to make those career choices. Jobs can be seen as positions requiring uh, certain skills within an organization. Uh, but again, remembering that it's not always about paid work. So lots of volunteers uh, have a job description lots of people working in internships will have a job description so uh, again we want to think about expand our, our view of what uh, what constitutes a job and uh, to allow the client to identify the skills that they have learned and demonstrated in any kind of work that they've done um, occupations can be seen as similar jobs found in uh, many organizations so as an example uh, when we talk about our field as being career development practitioners, that's a general occupational category. If we look at job titles uh, within that category, there's a huge variety. There could be everything from career advisor, career and employment specialist, career counselor, employment counselor. There's just a huge variety of job titles, but uh, they fall under the same general occupational category of career development specialist. And then the last definition you see on the page here, uh, the definition of work, uh, can be seen to be purposeful activity to earn money or other rewards um, and may produce a product or service for others. When we think about earning money or other rewards, uh, the other rewards could be that I'm maybe not doing a job for pay, but I am maybe semi-retired. I don't want to stay completely out of the labor market, so maybe I'm doing some kind of uh, volunteer work that brings me a great deal of satisfaction, even though I'm not being paid for it. Um, and again, usually work is something that is productive in some way. Usually uh, the end of 
doing a day's work you can point to something that you have produced or a service that you've delivered something is not necessarily tangible but something that you have uh, produced or developed as a result of doing this work so let's talk a little bit now about uh, just get a bit of an introduction to the idea of theories and this definition is taken from the textbook theories are a group of logically organized laws or relationships that constitute explanation uh, in a discipline so um, this means that uh, when you think about a theory it should have a set of principles a set of rules, a set of laws, some framework uh, that it brings to a particular uh, discipline, a particular idea and discipline. So if you examine the nursing field, uh, any of the medical professions, any of the regulated professions, uh, you'll find that all of them have some grounding in some kind of theory. So when we look at the career development field, career development theory attempts to explain behavior that occurs throughout one's lifetime in relation to school, work, life experiences, and social experiences. So we are attempting to understand the behavior of our clients using theory uh, to understand where they are right now, what their experience has been with uh, their career development, uh, and help us to understand, really the bottom line is to help us understand our clients better. Theories must be explicit about rules and terms, so to really be considered a theory, um, you need to have some kind of a structure, some principles, uh, some terminology that you incorporate in your theory. Theories should be precise about predictions and limitations, so clear about what, you know, if you're going to have a theory, what does that theory say about what you might expect in terms of client behavior, and also clear about its limitations, what, it, what it's addressing and what it really cannot address. Um, theories must be also uh, tested through research and so all of the theories that we will be looking at in this course have had some uh, research uh, that has been applied to them, have been uh, tested and validated in some way. Many of them have had tools that have been developed based on the theories and those tools have been validated. Uh, and theories must also be uh, consistent and clear. So that kind of goes back to the idea about being explicit about rules and precise and all of those things. So um, a theory should be fairly quantifiable. Here are the rules, here are the guidelines, this is what a theory, this particular theory is about. So some important considerations to think about in using career development theories when you are selecting uh, one or more theories and tools for that matter to apply to clients, you must consider first your client population. So who are you working with in the field? Do the theories and of course your client populations will be extremely diverse. Um, so do the theory, does the theory or the theories that you're looking at and, and any tools that you're using from those theories do they really apply to a particular client? Um, you want to have uh, as many uh, theories of personality and counseling uh, available to you. You should have kind of an eclectic approach so that you are uh, open to using a lot of different ideas and a lot of different theories so that you have a lot to choose from when you are working with your diverse client group. Um, the other thing you should think about is the theory's ease of application in counseling sessions and any uh, tools that go along with that theory. So as an example, I am certified in uh, the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator. This is a tool that I uh, really like. However, if you are familiar with the MBTI at all, you know it has 16 different types and a number of different scales that would need to be explained to a client for them to understand their own particular Myers-Briggs profile. Um, and the, some of the terminology used in the MBTI is not as easily understood as it might be in other theories. Um, so these might be some of the reasons why I might not to use, want to use this particular tool with certain clients or in certain groups. Some clients may have difficulty understanding uh, the terminology or the concepts. Sometimes I may not have enough time with a client or with a group to really do the Myers-Briggs type indicator uh, thoroughly in the way that it should be done. So it's important to consider uh, your particular client group and the theories that you're using and uh, whether those theories are easy to apply, uh, can be easily explained to the client, uh, and any tools that might go along with those theories 
uh, that they are also easy to apply and understand for the client. So to summarize, uh, it, all theories and related tools must be applied ethically when working with clients, and you'll be doing an ethics course uh, later in this semester, uh, should be applied with consideration for the diverse needs of clients. So for example, gender, culture, social location, should be applied in conjunction with counseling skills that you will learn in other courses, uh, and in conjunction with specialized knowledge of sources of occupational information. So uh, theories, career development theories, are the beginning of knowledge and the beginning of understanding uh, clients and working effectively with clients, but as you can see there are many other layers of, of um, uh, tools and skills that you're going to, and, and knowledge and information, that you're going to need to blend with your knowledge and application of theories. Some other important considerations, one theory or tool or approach does not fit all. So as I've talked about the idea of having diverse clients and having as many uh, types of theories and tools in your tool belt, uh, there's the idea that if you only use a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. So uh, the more tools you have in your tool belt, the better you'll be able to respond to the needs of your diverse client groups. So um, that's all the content for this week. I just wanted to uh, briefly give you an overview of the three different types of theories that we will be looking at in this course. And uh, these are divided into three different sections in the textbook. So the first uh, type of uh, theories is trait and type theories. These are covered in chap chapters uh, two to six. We will only be doing chapters two, four, and five uh, in this section in the textbook and the other chapters we will not be doing um, just because we're limited in how much time we have uh, in the course. Um, the second part, Lifespan Theory, Chapter 7. We will be doing uh, all four chapters in that section. And uh, the third one is, I apologize for the battery message. Um, the third one is Special Focus Theories, Chapters 11 to 15. We'll only be doing Chapters 11, 13, and 15 uh, in that section. Ultimately, you will want to use these theories in combination, and we'll be looking at that in uh, Chapter 16. So that gives you an overview uh, of, the, um, of the textbook. So uh, lastly, just before we wrap up, uh, some homework for this week. Uh, if you've not already done so, please read Chapter 1 in the Scharf textbook. Uh, the material from this week's uh, lecture was taken from Chapter 1. And then please go on and read Chapter 2 in the Scharf textbook, uh, as we will be covering those uh, concepts from that uh, chapter next week. If you've not already done so, uh, it's important that you do take the time to watch the videos with the welcome message and other documents that I've posted under Welcome and Course Introduction on Blackboard. And then if you've not already done so, please do review the course outline posted under Course Outline and Syllabus on Blackboard and the other materials posted there. It's really important that you uh, look at all of these documents because they form the framework for the course, they help you understand um, you know, the assignments and how they fit into the material. They help you understand the, um, the order of the ses sessions and the weeks and the topics that we're going to be doing. So please ensure that you do uh, look at all of those materials. Uh, attend, if you can, the synchronous welcome session. I will be uh, posting the, uh, the day and time of that and it will be later in the first week. Uh, if you can't attend or you've, you're watching this and you've already missed it, it will have been recorded so you can also view the recording. And then lastly, just post a brief introduction. I invite you to do that uh, on Blackboard, on the designated bulletin board, uh, just to say hello to your classmates. Uh, even though you're in a virtual class, I want to encourage you to kind of connect with each other. Some of you may be actually in face-to-face -face classes together, so you'll be able to also connect with each other uh, through the uh, bulletin board and Blackboard. Uh, this is not graded, but I do encourage you um, to do this. So uh, that's all for week one, and um, as always, if you have any questions or concerns at all, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me, and I will be in touch with all of you very soon.